anyways, um, 11th grade year, like I said, full-blown heroin addict, um, you know, just a fucking mess, had no friends in school, was completely isolated, which I liked. I liked being a lone wolf. I liked skipping class and walking to school. Testing, testing. Works. I think it works. <laughs> All right, Devin. Uh, Hi. Thanks for coming out, number one. Thanks and for coming here. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> to my gazebo. <laughs> the beautiful gazebo, indeed, in a rainy Pennsylvania day. Yes. Uh, so I guess we'll start. Where did you grow up? Um, I grew up in Horsham, Pennsylvania. It's about... Uh, 20 miles away from Philadelphia. So it's like the suburbs or whatnot. Um, yeah, and then uh, I moved to Pottstown when I was 19. And then just recently, two years ago, I moved to Phoenixville, PA. So I've stayed kind of locally. Um, but for right now, I definitely do want to venture out and stuff like that. I want to move to different places. And I eventually want to get a van and kind of like surf around that'd be pretty cool um but yeah that's where i grew up serving around that sounds kind of fun yeah definitely like i've always just like I, there's like this one guy on tiktok who has like a van and his dogs and they just go but that's an expensive lifestyle man so maybe one expensive. day i'll get there and i suck at saving money so <laughs> same that's all awesome. so in you grew up in horsham um and you did your family from there originally? Like, have you always lived in Pennsylvania? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, like, my mom grew up, like, in Willow Grove. My dad, same thing. So they always kind of... My dad was actually a drifter at some point. Like, he had a van. That's And awesome. he went to, like, California. He went to Washington. He went to all these different places. He was in the Marine Corps, too. So he went over to, like, China and Japan and stuff like that. So... Yeah. Pre TikTok, of course. No yeah, pre TikTok. TikTok. Yeah. He didn't have any videos with any, like, you know, fun dancing moves or anything. Yeah, right. <laughs> That's funny. And growing up, what was it like, like just growing up in the house? Uh, I guess in Horsham, right? Yeah, yeah. So um, my childhood's a little complicated. So um, yeah, I have a mom and a, and a dad and stuff like that. I have four older brothers. I'm the youngest, I'm the only girl. Um, so basically, um, growing up, you know, I have a biological mom and I have my dad, um, my parents that I have now, I call them mom and dad. This is where it kind of gets a little bit complicated. They met when they were 14 and 18. They fell in love, da, 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 da. A couple years down the line, they had my one brother. And, um, then shortly after that, they kind of separated. And then my dad, he met this other woman and he married her and he had my three older brothers and myself with her. Mm. Um, she was um, not the best mom, basically. Um, so. Why do you say that? Uh, she was very abusive. Uh, she was very mean. Uh, she was a drug addict and an alcoholic. Um, I think also the stress of having like four young kids is a lot for any person, even if they're not battling addiction. Um, and she also had some mental issues, stuff like that. Um, so there was like a lot of times we were like growing up with her. Um, luckily enough, I was young when I kind of got out of the situation, but there's certain things that kind of just stick even when you go through those things at such a young age. Um, so I would experience a lot of physical abuse that she would put on to my brothers, um, stuff like that. So I had to see them go through a lot of things. Luckily, I was never physically abused. I was more so like ignored. I was like treated like um, Rapunzel, basically. And I know that's like kind of a weird comparison because she was like a princess. But she basically would kind of just send me to my room a lot. And I spent a lot of time by myself. Um, but you had to see the brothers get 
abuse. Exactly. So like it was hard to understand what was happening or it would be like over like the littlest things too. Like if, if it was raining outside and we came inside and you know, our shoes were dirty and we didn't take them off in time and we stepped like two feet past the entrance. Mm -hmm. It was just heels were thrown, forks were being used and stuff like that. It was just, it was a really chaotic experience. And then once my dad finally realized, you know, like, I don't want my kids growing up like this. Um, he actually reconnected with the one that I call my mom now. And I call her my mom, like not a stepmom because she stepped up to that plate. You know what I mean? Like she's the one that cared for me, showed me love. She showed me how a mother should act to a child, um, mm. like really sincerely cared about me. So, um, like I said, I was young, like I was about like five or whatnot. And my dad finally filed for divorce, you know, and full custody for all of his children, which is, was very hard at that time for a dad to get full custody of all of his kids. Um, but you know, I remember I was like in kindergarten and I would have to go to court a lot, you know, mm -hmm. because we would have hearings and we would have, um, custody arrangements and stuff like that. She would never show up. She never wanted us. Um, sometimes she would fight for me and my one brother who who's only two years older than me. So at the time we were the youngest. So she would fight, she would. She only wanted she, us. Gotcha. Right, because okay. we were the youngest. She thought that she could still manipulate us into thinking like, oh, she was this perfect mom, stuff like that. Um, so there was times where she would trick people into like trying to kidnap us and stuff like that. So we had to be very safe going to school because obviously our parents can't like be there like watching us all the time. So the school knew our situation and whatnot. And so they would have to see us getting onto the bus, getting off of the bus, making sure we were there. If we were a little bit late to anything to make sure um, my dad and, you know, my mom like knew. Anyways, um, eventually you know, my dad got full custody and, you know, then I didn't hear anything more from my biological mom. Um, you know, so I'm very grateful that my dad just fought tooth and nail to grab me and my brothers out of that situation. Because if I grew up in that, God knows what the fuck I would have been into. I mean, I already kind of grew up a little rebellious and also my brothers. So like, what but, do you mean? What did you just act a little crazy growing up or? Yeah. Yeah. So like, I mean, like I said, I was very isolated as a kid, you know, I wasn't shown that, that care that, I mean, obviously my mom stepped up, she did her job. She did the best that she could, but I think, I think those abandonment issues started already playing out or whatnot. So, you know, growing up, I was like, just I was super bubbly, you know, I was super outgoing. I loved making new friends. I loved, you know, laughing and, and, you know, doing fun stuff. But then once I hit into middle school, um, I basically started just feeling really shitty about myself in all different types of ways about, you know, who I was character wise, uh, who I was, you know, physically, you know, I was kind of a bigger child. So I was very insecure about my weight. I also had maybe not the best friends that didn't motivate me in the best of ways. Um, so they would bring me down mentally. Um, and sometimes just I would just feel really bad about myself. So I started, you know, self harming a lot. Um, and then I also developed an eating disorder in eighth grade. So I was what, like 14 at the time, maybe 13. Um, and then, you know, that summer I lost a lot of weight right before high school. And as soon as I went into high school, people just treated me fucking differently. Like they were like, oh, you should come to these parties. You should hang out with us and, you know, do all this stuff and whatnot. And by then I kind of like was really in the pits of like a depression. So I didn't want to do anything. I just isolated. And, you know, I was self-harming every single night. Um, it's how I, you know, soothed myself. Um, and it was just because I never, I never felt comfortable with saying how I felt because I felt like how I felt was never, um, never important. I don't know. And also having so many brothers above me, 
Uh, I mean, obviously, not just was I going through stuff like that, but my brother, two years older than me, he had a really bad heroin addiction. Mm. Um, my other brother, four years older than me, you know, he was a rebellious teenager, like never coming home on time, you know, using drugs, drinking, stuff like that. Um, and then actually my second oldest brother, he was he was kind of the perfect kid. And I feel really bad because he kind of got also lack of attention because they didn't have to worry about him. They were like, okay, well, our other three kids are literally like self-destructing right now. Like you keep doing you, going to school, playing your sports, you know? And only later did I find out like that really affected him. And, um, and then also my oldest brother, he was in the army. So I didn't really see him that much growing up, didn't really have a connection with him, stuff like that. So moving forward with my story, um, when I was 16, I started using drugs. Um, you know, I've always been like a drinker and a smoker, like in, throughout middle school and stuff like that. But then I really connected with this one drug. It was Adderall. Mm. And um, I remember me and my friends, we took it for the first time. We were in fucking like 10th grade social studies and we took it at the same time. And I loved it. It was Zoom in up 24 hours and the next day I bought seven more so she didn't touch it for like probably like a couple next couple months but me I was like okay like I love this and then you know I did it every single day for months and months and months and then um you know my brother like I said he was a really bad heroin addict and um you know there was like a lot of family fighting about that stuff and you know just wanting to keep him safe and alive you know because that's fucking hard to do when you have a kid that's completely addicted to a substance and you know mm. you can't you can't really protect them you don't know what they're going to do once they leave the house and what are you going to do chain them to the couch right. which we've actually tried and didn't work <laughs> so um i kind of wanted to know what took my brother away i wanted to know like what is this feeling that he's chasing um i wanted to stop hating him i wanted to connect with him on something uh so i started to do heroin and I fell in love with it. I was like, oh, my God, I totally understand what you mean, man. So we started kind of like doing it together and whatnot. But he was already at a whole different point in his addiction where I was just kind of starting out mine. So I was like in a pink cloud phase of using. We're thinking nothing bad can happen. I can't overdose. I can't get arrested. I'm not going to like lose these relationships or anything like that. And then, um, you know, eventually he was in and out of rehabs and stuff like that. And I kind of just kept doing my thing. I kept using, I kept uh, doing stuff like that. Uh, met people outside of my brother who were using the same drugs. And I lost touch of my friend group that, you know, I won't say was sober, but weren't doing hard drugs at the time. So they kind of didn't want me to be involved with them because they were scared that, you know, I was going to probably like, you know, push it on to them. Or I think also they just, they did care about me and they didn't want to see me die. And it took a long time for me to actually realize that because I was angry when I got that phone call and my four best friends were like, I don't want to see you anymore. And I was like, I just got out of rehab. Like, what do you mean? Like, I need you guys right now. And they were like, sorry, like, we're just, we don't know what else to do for you, you know? So, of course... Um, like that broke my heart. And then I was just like, all right, like, fuck it. Like, I'm just going to basically, you know, do my thing and I'm just going to do it without you guys. Um, now how old were you, uh, at this point? At this point I was like about 16. Okay. Still in high school. Yeah. This was all during high school. Um, and then, you know, I still had like the eating disorder at play and whatnot. So I love that the drugs didn't even fucking make me hungry. I didn't even have to think about my eating disorder. I stopped self-harming. So like I was like, um, oh, this is great. Like I'm, I'm happier now because I don't feel like cutting myself or burning myself. Um, but by then I like literally have fucked up both of my arms, my legs, my stomach. Um, they were all scarring over. Um, so then I go into my 11th grade year. And I'm a full-blown heroin addict, um, popping Adderall. Um, and I just kind of didn't give a fuck anymore. So I started wearing, like, T-shirts. The first two years of my high school career, I wore nothing but long sleeves, even in the summertime. And um, then I kind of just walked into school one day, had my, you know, T-shirt on. And 
I actually, instead of getting like the opposite reaction, I mean, definitely people, like some people called me a fucking freak and didn't understand. And I mean, I didn't even really understand why I was fucking doing it and why I did it to the severity that I did, but I did it. And I was just always okay with my skin. I was always okay with what I was doing. Um, I'm not saying I was ever proud of it, but what am I going to do? It's what's done is done, you know? So, um, I actually connected with a lot of people during that time that were doing those things. And I would like to believe what I've said to them then has still helped them to this day. Um, because once you resort to that as a self-soothing method, sometimes it's hard to convince yourself that it's not going to work again. Mm -hmm. So even if you stop, and you try to create other habits that are going to be healthier for you to cope with your feelings. Sometimes it's still going to be in the back of your head, like being like, oh, remember it worked for you that one time, though? Remember that one time it actually took all that pain away and you got to think about something different? So anyways, um, 11th grade year, like I said, full-blown heroin addict, uh, you know, just a fucking mess, had no friends in school, was completely isolated, which I liked. I liked being a lone wolf. I liked skipping class and walking to school. I liked that I hung out in the nurse's office all the time. I didn't fucking care. And then um, I was going into my, uh, my homeroom that morning, and my homeroom teacher knew that I was really fucked up. And he was just like, Devin, are you okay? And I was just like, shut the fuck up. You know, like, I'm fine. Like, why do you even care? You know what I mean? And then by the time I got to first period, my principal came and pulled me out of the class and was just like, okay, uh, you need to come to the office and I'll, I'll hold your bag. And that's where my drugs were. And I was like, no, 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 no. I will hold my bag. And he like literally ripped it out of my hands. And he's like, let's go. And I was like, Okay, so um, while we're walking down to the principal's office, I'm seeing every single door that's an exit, and I'm just like, but if I run, he has my money and he has my drugs. So what the fuck am I gonna do without that? So like, I was like, I can't, I can't fight this grown ass man. First off, I'm high as shit right now. Like, I can't even barely walk, man. They take me to the nurse's office first to check my, you know, my vitals. They're like. So your pulse is really low. Basically, you're fucking high. And I'm like, no, I'm not. <laughs> and then they took me to the principal's office. They checked my bag. They saw all my bags of heroin. Um, and they basically were like, all right, well, now you have heroin on school property. So we need to arrest you. And I was like, oh, OK, like, whatever. At that point, like, I was just like, fuck it. You know, like, well, what, what am I going to do about this? So they arrested me in the principal's office. They took me out of the office. They pass me by the cafeteria, everyone's eating their lunch. And then as soon as they see police officers with this person, they everybody looks over and they just see me like walking out the door. People are coming into school late. I'm like, hey, what's up? You know, cause I just, I thought I was actually the shit because of it. And, um, and so I get fingerprinted, I get arrested. I get a felony charge for having possession of heroin on school property. Um, but I was set, I, at that point I was 17. So I didn't, I didn't have like any, like, uh, I didn't have to do anything. I got like a uh, community service after it or something. I had to go to court and then I had to go to rehab. So I went back to rehab and shit. And, um, was that in Pennsylvania as well? Yeah. Yeah. I've been to about six different facilities. Um, and then like four behavior hospitals all in between this time, you know? So, and then I come back from that. I couldn't go back into school. They expelled me from there and they were like, we don't want you back. And so then I basically did this online school for the rest of the year. I had a great tutor that came to this, uh, my home and, and she just taught me a lot about life. You know, she was an older woman. And she was just like, you know, I just hate to see you throw your life away. And at that point, I'm like, oh, Marie, you know, you're so cute. You know, like, what the fuck? You know, like, why do you care? You know, and that was my mentality was like, why do you care? about all of it. Um, so then, you know, senior year rolled around. Um, halfway through it, I was like always in rehab. So I was doing my schoolwork in rehab. If you're younger and shit, you can do your schoolwork in rehab. So that's what I did. And then halfway through the year, um, I said like, you know, I wanna go back to school or whatever. So they re-enrolled me uh, halfway through the year. To the public school? To the public school. And they actually allowed me to come back. Um, I think it's because they saw that I was like, I was working, you know, I was, I, I worked a lot. Like I always worked for my drugs. I never like stole. 
that much money. I always, I, I stole like 20 bucks here and there or whatever, but I never stole like jewelry or an amount of like anything like that. I just always provided for myself for my shit. Uh, but at that time, uh, I stopped, I mean, I was continuing to do heroin, but I also started to do meth. And uh, then it was just, I dropped heroin and I was like, I'm only going to do meth. So um, I started doing that. I was an IV drug user as well. So there's like a certain um, intensity to that shit. Cause it's funny, you'll be hanging out with drug addicts and like, we'll all be starting to do our shit or whatever. And then you pull out a rig and they're like, what? What are you doing? I'm like, first off, dude, we're all doing meth. Okay? <laughs> like you're not, you're not better than me cause you're putting it up your nose. Like, and so there was times where even in my friend group of addicts, like I was the odd one out because I was still doing it in this way that was just, just more, dis like just more disrupt, disturbing, I guess. I don't know. Um, so a lot of the times, like I couldn't use in their house, I would have to go out to my car and use and then come back into the house high or something like that. So it's just all really weird. Um, and then, you know, end of the line, like, end of senior year, I didn't have enough credits to graduate. And so they gave me this opportunity to do alternative school for another four months after the summer, and then I could graduate. So I eventually did that the whole time I'm just using, you know, kind of just fucking around, not really taking life seriously. Um, and I overdosed. I overdosed on heroin. Um, I was dating this guy at the time who um, didn't understand addiction. So he really wanted to understand, and I, I hate oh, kind of like the position that I put him in, because when we first started dating, I said, look, I'm a heroin and meth addict, and I'm not going to stop for anything or anyone. And he was like, okay, like, I, I like you. And I'm just like, oh, okay, <laughs> sucker. Uh, <laughs> um, but, uh, no, there was, there was a lot of love in that relationship, and there was a lot of um, – he was like my best friend. We could laugh about anything. We always got along really good, but he, um, he saw what I was doing to myself that I couldn't see. And, uh, the night that I overdosed, I was with him and I told him, I'm like, look, I'm going to use one last time. And then tomorrow I'm going to get sober. Like, let, let me just get high right now. And so he was just like, all right, like, you know, um, like, okay, like whatever, like I have to believe you. And so you know, like we uh, went to a hookah bar that night. I got high there. It was great. Having a good time. I came home with him. Uh, we're getting ready to go to bed. He's exhausted because, you know, he's just a normal person and wasn't doing drugs. So he was going to bed. And then I shoot up one more time on my floor. And then basically uh, I fall out right on my floor. And he didn't really know what was happening. So he picked me up. He brought me into bed because, you know, he just wanted to like sleep together. So luckily, you know, I was on his chest and he just felt me like stop breathing. And um, also luckily that he knew CPR. So um, he immediately like took me off off the bed, put me on the ground, checking like my airways, pulses, stuff like that. I was like not there. Um, so he just started doing CPR after a minute or two. He was just like, fuck, like I need help. So he ran in, got my parents. He called 911. My brother and him were taking turns doing CPR. Paramedics came, shot me with Narcan. The first thing I said when I came to was, I don't have any drugs. Get the fuck out of my room. Because I immediately saw people with badges and was like, Pow. So then after that, um, continued doing drugs. Went to another treatment center that didn't fucking work. Because um, I just wasn't ready for it. I wasn't ready for any of that stuff. I, I was very comfortable with my self-destruction I was very comfortable with uh with just dying that way honestly I had no goals no ambitions I mean nothing so um that relationship ended because obviously I was a dick and I put him through a lot and I didn't stop using for him um I mean there's I'll love him until the day I die but um you still keep in touch with him or Br briefly every now and again actually i mean uh you know i sometimes i just tell him thank you because he did save my life you know and sometimes yeah. i think about that and i just kind of like fuck dude like i i'm really sorry like it had to go that way because honestly i think i could have like married that guy honestly like he was so good to me so much kinder than the rest of the motherfuckers that i dated after him <laughs> and so then basically um 
I went to my last treatment center. My parents said, you can't come back to the house. So then they sent me to a recovery house in Pottstown. And that's how I moved to Pottstown. And during that time, I was in a recovery house, didn't like the fucking rules. Uh, and I met this other guy and um, moved in with him and his grandmother. And then we eventually got our own place. I was dry for about like a year. So dry means that like you're not sober, you're not in recovery, you're just abstaining from using. And it's a very bad place to be in because you're just kind of, you're not, you're not spiritually moving forward. You're not fixing any of the things that happened before. Da, 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 da. During that time, you know, when we were together with, um, when I was in Pottstown and I was together with this one guy, you know, I suffered a miscarriage with him, um, you know, and that led me back into drinking and smoking again. So I was just like, okay, fuck. Um, I gave myself an excuse because I went through a trauma basically. And so then, you know, me and him got our own apartment and whatnot. And then shit just went downhill between me and him. Um, there was a lot of fighting. There was a lot of um, verbal, you know, putting each other down. Um, you know, I can't really necessarily say all the blame is on him because I think there was a lot of things that I didn't cope with correctly. And I think I have lashed out. Um, but I think both of us together, we're very toxic toward, towards each other. It has gotten very physical sometimes. Um, and there was just a lack of respect there. There was a lack of, um, there was a lack of love. There was just a lack of a lot of things. It just wasn't really a good, a good place to be in. Um, I don't really like talking about it all that much, so I'm going to move on. Uh, <laughs> well, you're in a you're in a really good place today. Yeah. I mean, so, <clears throat> what what kind of things have you done to, you know, just like kind of improve your overall quality of life? You've got your own place. You're out of Pottstown. You're working. So, like, what led up to that? Like, what made the change for you? Yeah. So, um, it was you know definitely being more self sufficient. Uh, so I really relied on myself to get myself out of that situation. I have my own apartment here in Phoenixville. Um, I work very, very hard, um, not just in like my personal life, but also in my career. Um, but that's kind of a, you know, it didn't just happen just like that. So my first year, year in the apartment uh, after my relationship ended with the guy that I was living with in Pottstown, I had to recover from that relationship, but I never gave myself the time to do that. So I wrecked friendships. I wrecked other relationships. Um, because I was also drinking and smoking and I convinced myself that that was better than putting a needle in my arm, but I was still acting the same exact way. Um, I thought that if somebody loved me, that they should fix me. And so I put that pressure on a lot of people. So I basically, what happened was is I lost someone this last year who was very important to me. Uh, we were really close for seven years, like throughout all of this shit, this, this friend has been by my side. We related on everything. Um, and then basically this, like last year, uh, we don't have contact anymore. And probably seven months after uh, we stopped connecting, that whole seven months I was drinking, smoking. I started tripping on acid again. I started popping pills. Like I was like, oh my fucking God. Like I'm just going down this rabbit hole and I'm like literally going to fucking kill myself. Um, so... I just, um, I, you know, I just, I used the rest of the stuff that I had and I just like told myself, I'm like, I can't, I can't use it again. So right now I actually have 228 days clean and sober. That's awesome. Uh, yeah. Thank you. And, uh, you know, Congratulations, yeah. for the first 200 days, I honestly don't know how I did it because I didn't, I wasn't working a program. I only recently started going back to AA and, you know, I have a fellowship now and, you know, I'm just kind of, um. I'm doing what feels right. I honestly, now I don't know how I made it through those first 200 days because I don't, I don't know exactly if the pain was so much from losing that specific, specific person that it made me want to change or if it was just, I got sick and tired of fucking relying on shit that wasn't even making a goddamn difference. You know what I mean? So... 
you took it one day at a time. As yeah, I literally did. And, you know, I did have support along the way. I had good friends. I had good people that I could talk to about it. And now it's just like, I do these little things for myself every single fucking day. I, I do things that make me feel good and I refuse to let pain enter my body again. So like if something is going to get me really fucking sad, like I avoid it. Or if it's like inevitable to face it, then like fear comes in two different ways. So you can either say fuck everything and run or you can face everything and rise. So I try to take on that mentality every single day. And I just tell myself that, you know what, nothing's going to be as painful as when, you know, I had nothing. I was constantly using, you know, I had no goals and ambitions. Um, and it's, it's just that constant check in with yourself and those daily um, decisions that you're going to have to make. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's not, it's not really easy to tell you like how to do it. It's just, you know, I'm a person that suffers from depression as well. So like to say, you know, you have to be happy and positive all the time. That's fucking bullshit. What you got to do is you got to learn how to sit with your sadness and how are you going to use that to your advantage? So instead of, you know, sitting there and making a really bad decision because you're so fucking sad and it feels like it's just like basically you know, crippling you, like, how are you going to use that to your advantage? Because you know what, the only person that you have at the end of the day is your fucking self. And if, if that's all you have, like, don't you want it to be kind of a good experience? We only have one life. We're only here for like a fucking blip, dude. We're not here for that long. And I just think of it now, like a blink of a blink of an eye. I'm fucking 25. Now I started this shit when I was 14, you know, so what do I want to do? Keep destroying my life and keep experiencing all these fucking roads that I know lead to fucking nothing but jails, institutions, and death? Or do I want to try to make something of myself and like give myself the opportunity to even chase my dreams? Like I said to you earlier, Chris, you know, I'm, a, I'm an artist, I'm a painter. <laughs> And, uh, you know, that, that saved my life. I think finding something that you're passionate about. Yeah, I was going to ask, what, what suggestion would you get? And I think that's a good one, yeah. Mm -hmm. Something that you're passionate about that's something someone else can also not fuck with. So, also, I apologize if I'm cursing so much. It's just a part of my language. <laughs> um, I'm, on, I'm demonetized anyway, so. Okay. <laughs> but, um, yeah, something that someone else can't really take away you know, so like something that's inside of yourself, whether it be like you like to read, you like to go out for walks, you like, uh, you like animals, you know, there's so there's so many little things um, that you can even just try to find some joy in. And that's going to make a difference as, as long as you can try to be extremely grateful for those things in the beginning, like as simple as drinking water. You know, like being like, holy shit, I'm drinking water right now. Like, this is great. And it's going to be fucking silly at first. Like, you're going to be like, all right, it's not that big of a deal. Like, I'm literally just drinking water. But if you think about it, like, you can be like, oh, there's so many people that don't have water. Or, oh, remember that time that I was incredibly thirsty and I didn't have water. Like, you know what I mean? So it's just like, um, like, like I said, for me, it's the, it's the painting. It's uh, my job. I work in the animal welfare field, and it's extremely rewarding. And, you know, just doing these things, whether it be like, you know, quit your job because you're unhappy with it and find something that you're passionate about or something that pays you more, and that's going to make you happy. Find something you, gotta, you love to do. Exactly. But you also have to figure out, like, what's going to make you happy because some people, money's going to make you happy. All right, so go where the money is. If that's your goal right now, go where the money is. Like, if your goal right now is to be successful, spiritually connected to something all right go find an organization that you feel very passionate about you know um so i mean it's just taking one day at a time taking each stride by stride and it's just uh it's just making the best out of it so that's great advice yeah. it's uh <clears throat> your story is really inspiring and i'm glad you're here to talk about it as somebody whose parents both died from heroin so that's, it's, it's very inspiring to hear that you've made it through it and you're definitely providing hope to somebody out there for sure. So I hope so. I hope so. And I mean, like, I know, like, 
the fact of like recovery is like super scary. And I know when I first stepped room into a meeting, I didn't go back for years because I was like, oh my fucking God, like that was terrifying, you know? But like, even if uh, there's like, I mean, ever since COVID hit, there's like dozens of online meetings. Mm -hmm. So you can sit in your bed and just listen to the message or you can um, even uh, sit outside and smoke a cigarette, take a walk, listen to the message. I mean, cause it's just, uh, I never really got it until I just tried it that one more time, you know, build that network for sure. Exactly. Because, you know, like I said, I'm 25, I'm young. I don't have a lot of friends that are in the, in the program. I mean, I have friends in the program, but I have a lot of friends that aren't in the program and they don't really understand addiction. They're like, you're 25. Why don't you come to the bar? And I'm just like, <laughs> Cause I'm 25 and I'm an alcoholic and a drug addict, you know what I mean? So like, that's not, it's not good. It's not good. I don't know. I know where it's going to lead me and it might not lead me there right now when I come out, but like, what if, I don't know. Well, they say, what's the first step admitting you have a problem. Yeah. Right. Yep. It's been a long time since I've been in a meeting. <laughs> I used to go years ago. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, honestly, like it's just, uh, it's a fucking journey, and honestly, it just keeps getting worse if you keep going down it, man. So um, it's all up to you to make that decision, and, you know, I hope everyone the fucking best that's out there still suffering and using and, and stuff like that. Um, but, I mean, there, there's hope to a fucking max out there if you if you accept it. So I just say go into everything with open arms and kind of just take it for what it is and... Just know you deserve better because I convinced myself that for so long that I just didn't deserve to get clean. I didn't deserve to fucking feel happy, you know? It's but, important to love yourself. Yeah, it's so important. It's so easy to love somebody else because you just, it's such a distraction. And you honestly think that, you know, they're going to be able to fill all the voids inside of you. And it's just, it's, it's not going to suffice at all. It's really not. And loving yourself is going to take time and it's work. but. I think in the long run, it it, it uh, just helps you live a long, happier life. Honestly. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing. Thanks for letting me share. Yeah, no problem. Fun.